Homer's Iliad describes the Trojan War in epic poetry. But what really happened? I'm Steve Coleman, joined today by Todor Nikolov, defining our own Aegean history. All oh, right, Mycenae, we know these guys. How do they play? Uh, the Mycenaeans are led by Agamemnon, and uh, they're all about conquest and expansion. They're extremely adept at pacifying conquered territories. They also have benefits for their buildings from when their uh, high uh, influence is achieved. So when you conquer territories and you pacify them, you quickly make them more efficient than uh, other factions would. Uh, in addition to that, their command grants them access to um, instantly recruited units and ancillaries that scale with the level of the faction leader. So when you get your faction leader to a high level, you can instantly buff their army, which will help them get out of tight spots. Okay, it sounds to me like they'd be a good fit for the Atreus ancient legacy. Yes, quite right. Uh, the Atreus Ancient Legacy allows you to literally dominate over your enemies because when you complete different objectives against them, you gain this dominance resource and then you can spend it in diplomacy to boost the probability of your deals being accepted, you know, strong arm them. Uh, you can also spend it instead of regard in the court to achieve various cultural intrigues over there. And you can also use it as legitimacy. So this ancient legacy is actually the representation of the warlord who has proven his worth and now is using his prestige to achieve his goals. They sound like they'd worship Ares or Zeus, maybe. Who else do we have, though? We've got Poseidon, Zeus, Ares, Apollo, and Aphrodite. And you can perform hecatombs for them? What are they? Yes, hecatombs are uh, a perk of the Aegean pantheon of the gods. Uh, it's something that happens only with the Aegean gods. And uh, a hecatomb is a sacrifice that you need to spend food to enact. Every time you perform a hecatomb, all of your generals receive the effects of a prayer to the particular god, as if though they have visited a shrine, which means, again, a boost across all of your armies, depending on the gods that you're uh, performing this sacrifice to. I feel like Troy would worship Apollo. It just feels about right for me. Um, Priam, though, that's unexpected. Uh, what other surprises are the Trojans hiding for us? Yes, we've got Priam and also his son, uh, his sons Hector and Paris as playable characters. Priam is quite, you know, experienced and a powerful character, especially in the beginning of your campaign, but it also oh, makes wait. a lot of sense for you to level up Hector and Paris because at some point, Prime will die and the crown will likely pass to some of them or to another person that you choose. Trojans are all about diplomacy. They have various ways to increase their diplomacy standing. They also benefit from uh, having foreign influence in their lands because the presence of foreign people provides them with income of gold and it also debuffs any armies that dare to march against the holy city of Troy. Okay, so the, the Perseus ancient legacy is probably more in line with Troy. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that one? Yes, uh, it very much fits this sort of a master diplomat profile that the Trojans have. In the ancient legacy of Perseus, first of all, it grants you uh, the ability to globally recruit units from any point uh, on, the, on the map. And these are not only units from your roster, but also from uh, the units of any allies that you might have, military, defensive, or even vassals. You gain access to their rosters as well. The more allies you have and the bigger allies you have, the more you have of the unity resource, and the more unity resource you have, the, the better the global recruitment uh, you, you can do. In addition to that, as another source of unity, you can conduct games where you spend ancillaries to invite factions, and you gain a bit of, uh, of unity, you also get some economic resources, and in addition to that, you enforce peace between all participants and yourself. But be careful with that, uh, be mindful of the cooldown, and also the fact that you need ancillaries to, to start the games in the first place. Okay, well, it's a good thing Priam starts with the Wanax then. Uh, so how is a Wanax different from a Pharaoh or Hittite Great King? Uh, the Wanax is mainly different due to the, um, the royal powers that the Wanax has at his disposal. Uh, one of those uh, is war games, another type of games. Uh, the, the Mycenaeans must have been loving games. And you initiate these war games to, ex to increase your unit's experience. 
Another very useful power, especially as the Bronze Age collapses around you, is remote colonization. You target uh, an empty settlement, a raised one, and you will instantly colonize it. Of course, there are limitations to this. First, there is range. You, you can't uh, instantly colonize a settlement on the okay. other side of a campaign map, at least not at first. You need to have vision the over the settlement as well. Rest. So it is technically possible to colonize a settlement in Egypt from Troy, but it will take quite a bit of preparation and particular leveling up of your Wanax powers. There we are, a familiar culture, another seven total playable factions, new ancient legacies, gods and thrones to contend with. But the passing of Priam leaves a vacuum in the Aegean. Who will fill it? Join us next time as we look at dynasties.